So now we're going to hear from Dima Khalidi, who is the director of Palestine Solidarity Legal Support, PSLS, and cooperating counsel with the Center for Constitutional Rights. PSLS provides legal and advocacy support to advocates for Palestinian rights in the US. Dima is a Chicago-based attorney with a JD from DePaul University College of Law and an MA in International and Comparative Legal Studies from the University of London School of Oriental and African Studies. Prior to studying law, she worked in the West Bank at Birzet University, coordinating a study on the role of tribal justice mechanisms in the Palestinian legal system. Thank you, Dima. Good morning. It's such an honor to be here among so many amazing advocates for human rights. And thank you for this opportunity. Also, a quick shout out to the Palestinian Children's Relief Fund, which is having their event uh, in the same hotel. So it's, um, I hope some of you are here. The Israel-Palestine issue has long been a concern among uh, international rights advocates who recognize the wealth of international and human rights law issues that this conf conflict encompasses. What, hasn't, what has gotten less attention is the plight of those that advocate for Palestinian human rights. Human rights defenders, Palestinians, Israelis, internationals, uh, that are on the ground in, the, in Israel and in the occupied Palestinian territory are certainly bearing the brunt of the violence and the repression. But in this country as well, we're seeing an increase in repression of those that are advocating for Palestinian rights. On campuses especially, students take huge risks in speaking out about this issue. And this is in a forum that even the United States Supreme Court has called the quintessential marketplace of ideas. If people can't openly debate and advocate and challenge political orthodoxies on a college campus, where can they do it? Palestine Solidarity Legal Support, an initiative built in partnership with the Center for Constitutional Rights and that works closely with the National Lawyers Guild, was conceived in response to a palpable increase in attempts to rein in discussion of Palestinian rights in this country. Just in our first year, over 115 incidents of repression were reported to us. The overwhelming majority of these were on university campuses. And these range from smear campaigns, to infiltration of student groups, to criminal prosecutions for speech activities, and disciplinary sanctions against students, among many other things. Almost all of the incidents directly target speech activities, and almost all have relied on the dangerous notion that criticism of Israel is inherently anti-Semitic, and thus deserving of condemnation and punishment. To be clear, this isn't a new issue. Talking about Palestinian rights has long been taboo in this country. But today, with the growth of the movement for Palestinian rights in this country, with the increasingly obvious flagrancy and indefensibility of Israel's international law and human rights violations, with the growing use and effectiveness of nonviolent tactics such as boycott, divestment, and sanctions campaigns, that are trying to address a situation that the international community has been unable to do anything about for the last 65 years and more. There's also this increase in attempts to impede this movement. And because so much of the energy is coming from students, youth on campuses who are passionate about this issue, the repression has been especially pronounced on campuses against both students and academics who are speaking out. One part of the repression is governmental, and this audience knows very well uh, we've long seen the government repression of social justice and political movements, from civil rights to communists to America, the in American Indian movement to Puerto Rican independence to anti-apartheid, now environmental justice and animal rights movements. Uh, anti-war, labor, immigrants' rights movements. All of these past and pre pre present efforts to challenge the status quo have been met with the same kinds of government, government repression we're seeing against the Palestinian rights movement and against Arab and, Pal and Muslim communities as a whole. 
surveillance, infiltration, criminalization of dissent, and more and more surveillance, apparently. It's a, uh, the depth of it is, is staggering. It's also important to recognize that other student movements today are being targeted, illustrated recently in the case of CUNY students beaten, arrested, and prosecuted for protesting Petraeus' appoint, uh, appointment as an adjunct there or the pepper spraying of students uh, at an Occupy protest at UC Davis. What's maybe unique about the Palestinian rights movement in the US is the domestic constituency that's acting parallel to these government efforts and using a number of legal and other tactics to undermine this movement. We know that a number of groups that advocate for and defend Israel and its status in the US are mobilizing massive resources to counter the grassroots and increasingly diverse movement for Palestinian rights, we, again, with a focus on campuses. And they're doing so in a way that exploits existing anti-Arab and anti-Muslim sentiment, insinuating that those that advocate for Palestinian rights aren't only anti-Semitic, but also terrorist sympathizers, for example. So I want to briefly give a couple of examples of some of the tactics being employed by these groups to thwart student speech on this issue and suggest how they've affected this movement and finally talk a little bit about what we're doing about it. One little known, <clears throat> excuse me, one little known legal tactic is the use of Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. Several Zionist organizations have filed complaints with the Department of Education under Title VI, claiming that the activities of Palestinian rights advocates on campus, and we're talking here about things like protests, mock checkpoints to illustrate the situation for Palestinians in occupied territories, movies, lectures, these are the basis, bases of these complaints that these, these activities are creating a hostile environment for Jewish students that support Israel, and that universities aren't doing enough to protect them. So it's basically a discrimination or a harassment claim against the university. Several of these complaints were under investigation for some for up to 10 years, two, three, 10 years. A coalition of groups including PSLS, CCR, uh, the Asian Law Caucus, the NLG, Together with affected students, pushed back against this tactic with the DOE, and only recently, in August, uh, three complaints were three complaints against the University, uh, University of California schools dismissed. The reasoning was crucial. They said the, the the Department of Education said that the complaints were almost exclusively directed at speech activities about matters of public concern, meaning they're protected by the First Amendment. And that just because some students might find these activities offensive doesn't mean that they amount to discrimination and harassment. So these are really important decisions that we have to build on. And of course, they're now under appeal. Um, and there, there are still open investigations. And there are continuing threats of more uh, complaints. So this is an issue that won't go away. And we have to keep fighting this, this underlying narrative that anything uh, supportive of Palestinian rights uh, is discriminatory against uh, Jewish people. There are also dozens of examples of Palestinian rights activists being punished for protest activities. Some of you may have heard about the Irvine 11 case, for example, in which 10 students who protested Michael Oren's, the Israeli ambassador's speech at UC Irvine, by standing up one at a time uh, and making statements such as, you know, you're a war criminal. Um, these, and, and they walked out. So it was a, a, what they call a popcorn protest. Um, <clears throat> these students weren't only disciplined by their university. The, the uh, Muslim Students Association was on probation for a year, for one year after that event. But a year later, they were also prosecuted, uh, criminally prosecuted under an obscure California stra statute that prohibits disruption of public meetings. This is an unused statute. They, they uh, garnered all of the, the, the um, prosecutor's power to prosecute this case. The top prosecutors, uh, you know, they, they subpoenaed hundreds of emails that the students were sending. It, it was a really unbelievable prosecution. Um, that case is, they were 
convicted by a jury, ultimately. That case is under appeal. Uh, oral arguments are actually in a couple weeks. Um, the CCR, thank you, the CCR submitted an amicus brief arguing that the statute is unconstitutional and that in this case there was discriminatory enforcement. It's important to note here that, that, you, that Irvine, the University of California, Irvine, was under enormous pressure by the Zionist Organization of America to punish these students for their previous activities. And they were <coughs> elated when these students were, were prosecuted, ultimately. There are a few other examples of more, much less minor dis disruptions at universities. And in a couple of cases we've worked on, students have been disciplined by their university uh, for violating po university policies. Again, under enormous pressure from the Zionist Organization of America, the Anti-Defamation League, uh, and other organizations that are working very hard to, to see that such activities are punished. There are many other examples of administrative obstacles for Palestinian rights groups. Uh, security fees being uh, w uh, in, uh, applied to them, to their events. Extra scrutiny to approve their, their events. Consultation of pro-Israel groups on campus about their events. They're asking these pro-Israel groups if uh, they're okay with having this or that event on campus. And, uh, um, and another important thing, I'm running out of time, so I have to cut short here, but another important trend we're seeing is that legislators are also weighing in on this conversation. In California, the, the legislature passed a resolution uh, saying that, calling on California schools to enact policies prohibiting anti-Semitic speech and defining anti-Semitism to include common and well-documented criticisms of Israel and activities such as BDS, for example. So all of this pressure on universities to do something about, about Palestinian rights activ activism has had its effect. Universities are responding with ever stricter speech policies and students are frightened to be publicly involved. They don't want to put their names on things for fear, fear of re reputational harm. They're told by their advisors and communities to stay away from the issue. Affected especially are those foreign and un undocumented students who fear immigration consequences, the Muslim, Arab, and Palestinian students who are most vulnerable to accusations of terrorism in this country and who are already subjected to racist and Islamophobic attacks. Um, so uh, I can leave a little bit of what we're doing about this issue maybe to the question and answer um, period, but just briefly, we're documenting these kinds of incidents and trying to paint the bigger picture showing that this is really part of a widespread and coordinated assault on those trying to challenge the narrative about Israel in this country. And we're working with many different groups to respond to these incidents to advocate on, on students' behalves. With coalition partners, um, thank you, Naz, especially through the ICCPR task force, we also submitted a shadow report about the chilling effect of the Title VI investigations I talked about on student speech. So we need help building our networks to defend against these attacks on student speech. And we really expect the assaults against student speech to increase as these student movements grow. Undoubtedly, the restrictive speech policies being enacted will especially affect already marginalized voices, those that n most need to be heard on campuses. So there are many ways to get involved and I would love to talk with more of you about your uh, work and experiences and how we can collaborate on this and other issues. Thank you.